Good morning, evening, afternoon, every... Well, you get the point. This is Big Ash Random Vids, and today... Well, I'm doing homework. Um... Apparently, I have, um... Due in about two days, I have a little... Composition I need to write on, on... How to say nothing in 500 words. Now, this is an extra recording here, so I'm gonna skip all the details and... Get right to it. Or not. Nah. Let me ex let me at least explain my points. Now, I don't know about you, but regardless of my channel, I'm not one that really likes to read all the time. I mean, it's fine. It gets it gets the information. I'll I'll read the sign when I'm at the store. But long books when I have other things I I, I like to do better. It's not really my strong suit. So. I like to look for audio readings, which really helps. And excellent for multitasking, but when you're reading, no. It's just that one task, you can't do other shit. Unless you're really... Mm, that productive. But most people aren't. Either way, I looked on YouTube, I looked on Google, I looked everywhere. There were variations var var variations of, the, um, of a book, there were other things of a book. But there was no audio files. None at all. I was surprised. I was appalled. And I was dumbfounded. But then I remembered. I turn to my right, and I see the expensive-ass mic that I paid for, for this very reason. And I thought to myself, Hey, why don't I do it? <laughs> so, might as well. So without further ado, this is... How to Say Nothing in 500 Words by... Paul Roberts. Paul Roberts, 1917 to 67, was a scholar of linguistics and a respected teacher whose textbooks helped scores of high school and college students become better writers. Roberts' work included English syntax and patterns of English, the following selection from his best known book, Understanding English. If you want more information, you have to look that crap up, but this right now, this is just a reading of Whatever the hell this is. Move this up, get a little more comfortable. There we are. How to say nothing in 500 words. Nothing about something. It's Friday afternoon, and you have almost survived another week of classes. You are just looking forward to dreamily to the weekend when the English instructor says... For Monday, you will turn in a 500-word composition on college football. Well, that puts a good big hole in the weekend. You don't have any strong views on college football one way or the other. You get rather excited during the season and go to all the house games and find it rather more fun than not. On the other hand, the class has been reading Robert Hutchins, the anthology and perhaps Shaw's 80-yard run. And from the class discussion, you have got the idea that the instructor thinks college football is for the birds. You are no fool, you. You can figure out what side to take. After dinner, you get out the portable typewriter. Please note, this story has been written in 1950, so a portable typewriter is uh, our computer. <laughs> After dinner, you get out the portable typewriter that you got for high school graduation. You might as well get it over with and enjoy the Saturday and Sunday. 500 words is about two double-spaced pages with normal margins. You put it in a sheet of paper, think of a title, and you're off. Why college football should be abolished. College football should be abolished because it is bad for the school and is also bad for the players. The players are so busy practicing that they don't have time for their studies. This, you feel, might be... is a mighty good start. The only trouble is that it's only 32 words. You still have 468 to go. And you're pretty well exhausted. You're pretty well exhausted the subject. It comes to you that you do your best thinking in the morning. So you put away the typewriter and go to the movies, but the next morning you have to do your washing and some math problems. 
and in the afternoon you go to the game. The English instructor turns up too, and you wonder if you've taken the right side after all. Saturday night you have a date, and it's Sunday morning and you have to go to church. You shouldn't let English assignments interfere with your religion. That with one thing and another. It's ten o'clock Sunday night before you get out to the typewriter again. You make a pot of coffee and start to fill out your views on college football. Put a little meat on the bones. Why college football should be abolished? In my opinion, it seems to me that college football should be abolished. The reason why I think this is to be true is because I feel that football is bad for the college in nearly every aspect. As Robert Hutchkin says in his article on our anthology, which he discusses college football, it would be better if the colleges had, a ra had racehorses and had races with one another, because then the horses would not have to attend class. I firmly agree with Mr. Hutchins on this point, and I am sure that in many other students would agree too. One reason why it seems to be... Why well, it seems to me that college football is bad is that it has become too commercial. In the olden times, when people played football just for the fun of it, maybe college football was all right, but they did not play football just for fun, just for the fun of it now, as they used to in the olden days. Nowadays, college football is what you might call a big business. Maybe this is not true for at all schools, and I don't think it's especially true here at State, but, I cer but certainly in this case, at most colleges and universities in America nowadays, as Mr. Hutchins points out, his very interesting article, actually the coaches and alumni go around to the high schools and offer the high school stars large salaries to come to their colleges and play football for them. There was one case where a high school star was offered a convertible if he would play football for a certain college. Another reason for abolishing college football is that it is bad for the players. They do not have time to get to, to, a, to get a college education because they are too busy playing football. A football player has to practice every afternoon from 3 to 6, and then he is too tired that he can't concentrate on his studies. He just feels like dropping off to sleep after dinner, and then the next day he goes to his classes without having studied, and maybe he fails the test. Good ripe stuff so far, but you have 151 words from home. One more push. Also, I think college football is bad for the colleges and the alumni. Oh no, and the universities. Page break. Because not very many students get to practice in it. Out of a college of 10,000 students, only 75 or 100 play football, if that many. Football is what you might call a spectator sport. That means that most people go to watch it, but do not play it themselves. 415. Well, you still have a conclusion, and when you retype it, you can make m margins a little wider. These are the reasons why I agree with Mr. Hutchins that college football should be abolished in American colleges and universities. On Monday, you turn it in, moderately hopeful, and on Friday it comes back marked weak in content and sporting a big D. This essay is exaggerated a little, not much. The English instructor will recognize it as reasonably typical of what an assignment on college football will bring in. He knows that nearly half the class will contrive in 500 words to say that college football is too commercial and bad for the players. Most of the other half will inform him that college football builds character and prepares one for life that brings prestige to the school. As he reads paper after paper, saying all the same things in almost the same words, all bloodless, 500 words dripping out of nothing. He wonders how he allowed himself to get trapped into teaching English when he might have had been happy and interesting life as an electrician or a continent man. Well, you may ask what, the, what you can do about it. 
The subject is one on which you have few convictions and little information. Can you be expected to make a dull subject interesting? As a matter of fact, that's precisely what you're expected to do. This is the writer's essential task. All subjects, except sex, are dull until somebody makes them interesting. The writer's job is to find the argument, the approach, the angle, the wording that will make the reader with them, that will take the reader with them. This is seldom easy, and is particularly hard in subjects that have been much discussed. College football, fraternities, popular music is... is chivalry dead, and the like. You will feel that there is nothing you can do with a subject except repeat the old barometers. But there are some things you can do which will make your papers, if not throbbingly alive, at least less insufferably tedious than they might otherwise be. Avoid the obvious content. Say this assignment is college football. Say that you've decided to be against it. Begin by putting down the arguments that come to your mind. Is it too commercial? It takes the students' minds off their studies. Is it hard on the players? It makes the university a kind of circus instead of an intellectual center. For most schools, it is financially ruinous. Can you think of any more arguments just off ha just offhand? All right. Now, then you write your paper. Make sure that you don't use any of the material on the list. If these are the points that leap to your mind, they'll leap to everyone else's too. And whether you get a C or a D may depend on whether the instructor reads your paper early, when he is fresh and torrent of late. When the sentence, in my opinion, college football has become too commercial, inexorably repeated, has brought him to a brink of lunacy. Be against college football for some reason or reasons of your own. If they are keen and perceptive ones, that's splendid. But if they are trivial or foolish or indefisible, you are still ahead so long as they are not everybody else's reason too. Be against it because the colleges don't spend enough money on it to make it worthwhile, because it is bad for the characters of the spectators, because the players are forced to attend classes, because the football stars hog all the beautiful women, because it competes with baseball and therefore an un-American and possibly communist inspired. There are lots of more or less unused reasons for being against college football. Sometimes it is a good idea to sum it up and dispose of the tire and conventional points before going on to your own. This has the advantage of indicating to the reader that you are going to be neither tired nor conventional. Something like this. We are often told that college football should be abolished because it has become too commercial or because it is bad for the players. These arguments are no doubt very corrogant, but they don't really go to the heart of the matter. Then you go to the heart of the matter. Take the less usual side. One rather simple way of getting interest into your paper is to take the side of the argument that most of the citizens will want to avoid. If the assignment is an essay on dogs, you can, if you choose, explain that dogs are faithful and lovable companions, intelligent, useful, as guardians of a house and protectors of children, indispensable in police work. In short, when all is said and done, man's best friend. Or you can suggest that those big brown eyes conceal more often than not. A vacuity of mind and an inconsistency of purpose that the dogs you have known most intimately have been managey, ill-tempered brutes, incapable of instruction that only your nobility of mind and fear of arrest prevents you from kicking the flea-ridden animals when you pass them on the street. Naturally, professional convictions will sometimes dictate your approach. If the assignment subject is 
is Methodism rewarding, or is it individual? And you are poious, a poious Methodist. You really have no choice. But few assignments, subject, if any, will fall in this category. Most of them will lie in broad areas of discussion, with much to be said on both sides. They are intellectual exercises, and it is legitimate to argue how one way and now another, as debates do in similar circumstances. Always take the side that looks to you hardest, least defensible. It will almost always turn out to be easier to write interestingly on that side. This general advice applies to when you have a choice of subjects if you are to choose among the value of fraternities and my favorite high school teacher and what I think about beetles. By all means, plump for the beetles. By the time his structure gets to your paper, he'll be up to his ears in tedious tales about the French teacher at the Bloomberg High and assertions about how fraternities build character and prepare one for life. Your views on beetles, whatever they are, are bound to be a refreshing change. Don't worry too much about figuring out what the instructor thinks about the subject so that you can cuddle up with him. Chances are his views are no stronger than yours. If he does have convictions and you oppose them, this problem is to keep from grading you higher than you deserve in order to show that he is not biased. This doesn't mean that you should always cantankerously dissent from what the instructor says. That gets tiresome, too. And if a subject of signs is, my pet peeve, do not begin with, my pet peeve is. The English instructor who signs the papers on, my pet peeve. This is still funny during the War of 1812, but has sort of lost its edge since then. It is, in general, good manners to avoid personalities. Spin out of abstraction. If you will study the essay on college football, you will perceive that one reason, that one reason is appalling dullness. Is that it never goes down to particulars. It is just a series of not very glittering generalities. Football is bad for the colleges. It has become too commercial. Football is a big business. It is bad for the players, and so on. Such round phrases, tutting against the reader's brain, are unlikely to convince them, though they may well render them unconscious. If you want the reader to believe that college football is bad for the player, you have to do more than say so. You have to display the evil. Take your roommate, Alfred Schmerkins. No, oh, whatever the heck his name is. The second string center. Picture poor old Alfie coming home from football practice every evening, bruised and aching, agonizingly tired, scarcely able to shovel even the mashed potatoes into his mouth. Let us see him staggering up to the room, getting out of his econ textbook, peering desperately at, at it with his good eye, falling asleep and failing the test in the morning. Let us share his unbearable tension as Saturday draws near. Will he fail? Be demoted? Lose his monthly allowance? Be forced to return to the coal mines? And if he succeeds, what will be his reward? Perhaps a slight... Ripple of applause when the third steering center replaces him. A moment of elation in the locker room if the team wins. Of despair if he loses. What will he look back on when he graduates from college? Toil and torn ligaments? And what will be his future? He's not good enough for pro football, and he's too obscure and weak in Eon to succeed in stocks and bonds. College football is tearing the heart from Alfie Smitkins, and when it finishes with him, will callously toss aside the shattered hulk. This is no doubt a weak enough argument for the abolition of college football, but it is a slight better than saying there are three or four variants that college football, in your opinion, is bad for players. 
look at the work of any professional writer and notice how consist constantly he is moving from the generally the abstract statement to the concrete example the facts and figures the illustration if he is writing on june veiled delinquency he does not just tell you that juveniles are it seems to him delinquent and that in his opinion something should be done about it he shows you juveniles being delinquent tearing up movie theaters in buffalo stabbing high school principals in dallas smoking marijuana in porto allo and more than likely he is moving towards some specific remedy not just a general writing of a hands it is no doubt possible to be too concrete too illustrative or anecdotal but few inexperienced writers er this way for most of the students no i'm serious few inexperienced writer have been as just written e r r okay for most for the most soundest advice is to be seeking always for the picture to be always turning general remarks to seeable examples don't say sororities teach girls the social graces say sorority life teaches a girl how to carry on a conventional while pouring tea without sloshing the tea into the saucer don't say i like certain kinds of popular music very much say whenever i hear gerber splitknit splitknittle or whatever the hell his odd name is play mississippi man on the trombone my socks creep up my ankles get rid of obvious padding the student toiling away at his weekly english theme is too often tormented by a figure five hundred words how he asks himself is he to achieve this staggering total obviously by never using one word when he can somehow work in ten he is therefore seldom content with his plain statement like fast driving is dangerous this has only four words in it he takes thought and the sentence becomes in my opinion fast driving is dangerous but better, better but he can still do better still in my opinion fast driving would seem to be rather dangerous if he's really adept it may come out in my humble opinion though i do not claim to be an expert on this completable subject fast driving in most circumstances would seem to be rather dangerous in many respects or at least so would seem to me thus f four words have been turned into forty and not an ottawa of content has been added now this way to go about reaching five hundred words if you are content with a d grade it is as good as as any but if you aim high if you aim higher you must work differently instead of stuffing your sentences with straw you must steadily get rid of the padding to make your sentences lean and tough if you are really working at it your first draft will generally exceed the required total and then you will work it down thus it is thought that in some quarantines and that facilities do not contribute as much as might expected to campus life some people think that fraternities contribute little to campus life the average doctor who, who participates in small towns or the community must toil nights and day to heal the sick most country doctors work long hours when i was a little girl i suffered from shyness and embarrassment in the presence of others i was a shy little girl it is absolutely necessary for the person employed as a marine as a marine fireman to give the matter of steam pressure his undivided attention at all times the fireman has to keep his eye on a steam gauge you may ask how you can arrive at five hundred words at this rate simply you dig up more real content instead of taking a couple of obvious points off the surface of a topic and then circling warily around them for six paragraphs you work in and explore figure out the details 
you illustrate. You stay that fast driving is dangerous, and then you prove it. How long does it take to stop a car at forty and eighty? How far can you see at night? What happens when a tire blows? What happens in a head-on collision at fifty miles per hour? Pretty soon your paper will be full of broken glass and blood and headless torsos by reaching five hundred words with will not really be a problem. Pretty straightforward. Call a fool a fool. Some of the padding in freshman themes is to be blamed, not on anxiety about the word minimum, but on excessive timidity. The student writers, in my opinion, the principal of my high school acted in ways that I believe very unbased person would have to call foolish. This isn't exactly what he means. What he means is, my high school principal was a fool. If he was a fool, call him a fool. Heading, hedging. The thing about with, in my opinions, and it seems to me's, and as I sees it's, and at least from my points of views, gains you nothing. Delete these phrases whenever they creep into your and creep into your paper. The student's tendency to hedge stems from a modesty that in other circumstances would be I am lost, okay. The student's tendency to hedge stems from a modesty that is in other circumstances would be commendable. He is, he realizes, young and inexperienced, and he half suspects that he is dopey and fuzzy-minded beyond the average. Probably only too true, but it doesn't help to announce your incompetence six times in every paragraph. Dec decide that you want what you want to say, and say it as vigorously as possible without apology in plain words. Linguistic difference can take various forms. One is what we call I'm sorry, this word is smudged out. Impedimism? Hmm. This is the tendency to call a spade a certain garden implement, or woman's underwear unmentionables. It is stronger in some eras than others, and in some people than others, but it is all but it always operates more or less in a subject that we are touchy or taboo. Death, sex, madness, and so on. Thus we shrink from saying he died last night, but stay and said passed away, left us, joined his maker, went to his reward, or we tuck off the tension with lighter cliché, kicked the bucket, crashed his chips, handed in his diner pail. We have found all sorts of ways to avoid saying mad. Men tally ill, touched, not quite right upstairs, feeble-minded, innocent, s simple, off his trolley, not in his right mind, even such a now plain word as insane began as in euphemism with the meaning not healthy modern scene particularly psychology contributes to the many pilosyllables in which we can warp into our thoughts and blunt their force to many writers there is no such thing as a bad schoolboy schoolboys are maladjusted or unoriented or misunderstood or in need of guidance, or lacking in continued success towards satisfactory interrogation of the personality and social unit. But they are never bad. Psychology, no doubt, makes us better men or women, more sympathetic and tolerant, but it doesn't make writing any easier. Had Shakespeare had been confronted with psychology, to be or not to be, might have come out to continue as a social unit or not to do so. That is, the personally personality problem whenever it is a better sign of integration with the consciousness level to display psychic or psychic tolerance towards maladjustments and representations induced by one's lack of orientation in one's environment or but hamlet would have never had finished his soliloquy 
writing in the modern world, you cannot altogether avoid modern junction, nor, in an effort to get away from the euphism, should you salt your paper with four-letter words. But you can do so much if you will mount guard against those roundabout phrases whose echoing phyllosyllables that tend to slip into your writing to rob it of its crisperness and force. Beware of a pat expression. Other things being equal, avoid phrases like other things begin equal. Those sentences that come to you whole or in two or three doughy lumps are sure to be bad sentences. They are no creation of yours, but pieces of common thought floating in the community soup. Pat expressions are hard, often possible to avoid, because they come too easily to be noticed and stern and seem to be necessarily to be dispensed with. No writer avoids them altogether, but good writers avoid them more often than poor writers. By pat expressions, the mean such as tags as to all practical intents and purposes, the pure is simple truth from where I sit, the time of his life, to the end of the earth. In the twinkling of an eye, as sure as you're born, over, the, over my dead body, under cover of darkness, took the easy way out. Then all is said and done, told him time and time again, parted the best of friends, stand up to be continued, gave him the best years of her life, worked her fingers to the bone. Like other clichés, these expressions were once forceful. Now we should use them only when we can't possibly think of anything else. Some pet expressions stand like a wall between the writer, and though such a one is the American way of life, many student writers feel that when they have said something accords with the American way of life, or not, they have exhausted the subject. Actually, they have stopped at the highest level of abstraction. The American way of life is the complicated sets of bonds between 180 million ways all of us know this when we think about it, but the tag phrase too often keeps us from thinking about it. So with many other phrases dear to the politician, this great land of ours, the main, the man in the streets, our national heritage, these may prove our patronism or give a clue to our political beliefs, but otherwise they add nothing to the paper except words. Colorful words. The writer builds with words, and no builder uses raw materials more slippery and elusive and treacherous. A writer's work is a constant struggle to get the right word in the right place, to find that particular word that will convey his meaning exactly, that will persuade the reader, or soothe him, or startle, or amuse him. He never succeeded altogether. Sometimes he feels that he scarcely succeeds at all, but such success as he is are that what make the things worth doing. There is no book of rules in this game. One progress, though everlasting experiment on the bias of ever-wandering experience, there are few useful generalizations that one can make about words as words, but there are perhaps a few. Some words are what we call colorful, but we mean what they are calculated to produce a picture or induce an emotion. They are dressy instead of plain, specific instead of general, loud instead of soft. Thus, in place of her last beat, we may write, her heart pounded, throbbed, fluttered, danced, instead of, he sat in his chair, we may say, he lounged, sprawled, coiled, instead of, it was hot. We may say it was blisteringly, muggingly, suffocating, steaming, wilting. However, it should not be supposed to be that fancy word is always be is always better. Often it is as well to write her heartbeat or it was hot, if it is all it did or all it was. Ages differ in how their purpose and how they like their purpose. The 19th century linked it rich and smoky. 
The twelfth has usually preferred it lean and cool. The twentieth century writer, like all writers, has is forever seeking the exact word, but is wary of sounding feverish. He tends to pitch it low, to understate it, to throw it away. He knows that if it gets too colorful, the audience is likely to giggle. She sees how this strikes you, as the rich golden glow of a sunset died away amongst the eternal western hills. Angela's lumped blue eyes look softly and trustingly into Margaret's Montigues, flashing brown ones, and her heart pounded like a drum in a time with a joyous song of surging in her soul. Some people like that sort of thing, but most modern readers would say, Good grief! and turn on the television. Colored words. Some words we could all we could call not so colorful as colored, that is loaded with assinations, good or bad. All words except phrases, structure words have a tro associations of a s of some sort. We have said that the meaning of a word is a sum of contexts in which it occurs. When we hear a word, we hear it with an echo of all the situations in which we have heard it before. In some words, these echoes are obvious and distinguishable. The word mother, for example, has, for most people, agreeable associations. When you hear mother, you probably think of home, safety, love, food, and various other pleasant things. If one writes she was like a mother to me, he gets an effect which he would not get in she was like an aunt to me. <laughs> the adversary makes use of the association of mother by working it in when he talks about his product. The politician works when he talks about himself. So also with such words as home, liberty, fireside, com uh, contingent, um, patriot, tenderness, sacrifice, childlike, manly, buff, limpid, all of these words are loaded with favorable association that would rather that would be rather hard to indicate in a straightforward definition. There is more than a literal difference between they sat around the fireside and they sat around the stove. They might have been equally warm and happy around the stove, but a fireside suggests leisure, grace, quiet tradition. Conchigal company and a stove does not. Controversy. Some words have bad associations. Mother suggests pleasant things, but mother-in-law does not. Many mother-in-law are heretically lovable, and some mothers drink gin all day and beat their children and sensible. But these facts of like are beside the point. The thing is that mother sounds good, and mother-in-law does not. Or consider the word intellectual. This would seem to be a compliment, complimentary term, but in, a, but in point of effect it is not, for it has picked up associations of impracticality and ineffectuality and general dopeness. So also with such word as liberal, reductionary, communist, solidarist, capitalist, radical, school teacher, truck driver, undertaker, operator, salesman, hunchster, spectator, these convey meanings on the literal level, but beyond that, sometimes in some places, they convey contempt on the part of a speaker. The question of whether to use loaded words or not depends on what is being written. The scientist, the scholar, try to avoid them. For the poet, the advertising writer, the public speaker, they understand they, they are standard equipment. But every writer should take care that they do not substitute it for thought. If you write, anyone who thinks that nothing is so, is but a socialist, or a communist, or a capitalist, you have said nothing except that you do not like people who think that, and such remarks are effective only with the most narrative readers, naive readers. It is always a bad mistake to think your readers more naive than they really are. Colorless words. 
But probably most student writers come to grief not with words that are colorful, but those that are colored, but with those that have no color at all. A pet name is nice. A word we fa- a word we would find it hard to despise, to dispense, when casual conversation, but which is no longer capable of adding such to a description. Colorless words of those such general meanings that in par- that in a particular sentence they mean nothing. Slang adjectives like cool, that's really cool, tend to explode all over the language. They reply to everything loose, to everything, lose their original force, and quickly die. Beware also of nouns of very general meaning like circumstances, cases, instances, aspects, factors, relationships, attitudes, eventualities, etc. In most circumstances, you will find an you will find that those cases of writing which contain too many instances of words like these will, in this and other aspects, have factors leading to unsatisfactory relationships, with the reader resulting in unfavorable attitudes on his part and perhaps other eventualities, like a grade of D. Notice, also notice that etc. means... It means, I like to make this list longer, but I can't really think of any more examples. And that is it. Wow, this took me 41 minutes. Well, cut, well, um, taking out the, taking out the, intro, uh, the uh, intro, about probably 30, 38 minutes. Either way, I fucked up a lot, I stopped a lot, I fucked up words, but whatever. Hey, and um, uh, if you read this and, and hate it that and hate it that much... I welcome you to to make a better one. Seriously, make a better one, because this is really all all there is on the web on on the internet right now, and the internet is a big place. So that's saying a lot. This is the only reading on the internet of this. So, yeah. Anyways, this has been Big Ash Run the Vids. I came, I read, I hated it, and now time to do that. Time to do that damn report. <sighs> big Ash out.